Hello, I'm Steve Balch, director of the Texas Tech Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. And I'd like to welcome you to the second Institute Encounter of the spring semester of 2018. Um, we're kind of picking up in a way and from where we left off last time. You may recall that when we had Dr. John Walbridge here, our discussion was about uh, the course of Islamic philosophy and science. Um, uh, this week, the week of, of, of this interview, uh, is a general sort of commemoration of the scientific revolution and an examination of science's operation and controversies surrounding science in the modern world. And um, we are very honored and privileged to have uh, as our um, distinguished guest for this week, Dr. Uh, Peter Deere, who is Professor of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University and a leading historian of science. Um, he's written many books and articles. Uh, three important ones that come to mind are The Intelligibility of Nature, um, which I've just had the pleasure of reading, uh, Discipline and Experience, which is about 16th century mathematics, um, and the third one is With revolutionizing uh, the sciences and revolutionizing the sciences uh, which is about the scientific revolution mm -hmm. so um, we're going to talk about all of that today I, I you know I can't think of uh, anything more important as an institution a project and a phenomenon to the nature of Western and world civilization today than is science so it's a subject that's very worth examining. And, and let me begin our discussion by asking uh, Dr. Deere what, what science is. How should we understand it? Well, that's a good question. Uh, um, there's no pat answer to it, of course, and philosophers for a long time have uh, wondered about the so-called demarcation problem, uh, whereby you distinguish bodies of knowledge that count as science from bodies of knowledge that don't count as science, which is uh, generally taken to uh, give them a lower standing, a lower status. Um, but there is no pat answer, really. Uh, in practical terms, and from the perspective of a historian of science, um, science is a name applied to various more or less formalized disciplines of knowledge uh, that have some kind of uh, coherence, uh, conceptual and um, methodological coherence, as perceived by their own practitioners. Um, it's very difficult to give a, a global definition that would include things that we want to count as science and exclude things that we don't want to count as science. And of course in different languages um, there's different terminology. In, in German you don't talk about science, you talk about uh, various forms of Wissenschaft and that can include um, areas that in English you would not tend to call science. It's like the law, for example, or theology. Um, so it's a difficult category to use. Uh, and yet, we have to use it. So when you talk about the scientific revolution, or write a book called Revolutionizing the Sciences, um, what, are, what are you yourself, how do you see yourself as, as focusing on something particular? What, mm -hmm. uh, how do you establish those boundaries? Well, the great thing about uh, looking at the so-called scientific revolution is that there's a pre-established storyline uh, that's been uh, created over the course of many decades or even centuries um, about the development of uh, ideas, scientific ideas as we would say, um, in the 16th and 17th centuries in particular, uh, the great age of Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo and Newton and so forth. Um, and so one has uh, a pre-existing storyline to work from which makes it much easier to determine what's interesting and what's not interesting, or what's significant or what's not significant. If you were confronting that material cold, as it were, uh, it would be less easy to put together a neat storyline. That, that goes for any area of history, I suppose. Uh, one's always uh, developing from accounts uh, that have been produced by historians earlier, uh, and that gives you an orientation. Because it's very difficult to go in cold and say this is significant and this isn't so significant, and to determine what the real questions are that you want to be asking. So say that one wanted to um, proceed by exclusion, uh, try to get a 
handle on what science is by looking at what we think science isn't. So, <clears throat> say somebody came along and said, carpentry is a science. Is carpentry a science? What would you say in reply? Um, it has been counted as such. Um, the mathematical sciences, as they were recognized in the European Middle Ages, for example, or even in late antiquity, um, the mathematical sciences sometimes included practical things like carpentry, uh, depending on who you ask. Actually, particularly, I'm thinking about a, a classification of the sciences uh, that you find in the Islamic world, uh, which includes specifically carpentry among the mathematical sciences as a more practical uh, uh, form of a particular mathematical science, its relationship to geometry and so on. So again, this terminology can be deployed quite broadly depending on circumstances. Of course, we wouldn't think that anything that went on during the 16th and 17th century amounted to a carpentry revolution. That's true. Sort of not, not quite part of the process. Yeah. Um, is there a distinction? I mean, uh, the, the term science in English, um, mm. as I understand it, was usually applied pre, say, 19th century to bodies of skills. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I will, uh, I remember London cab drivers talk about having the knowledge. Right. Uh, they might talk about having the science of, of getting around the city, mm. and in that older sense, that, that would have been an or appropriate Or pugilism is the sweet science. That's yeah. right. Right, uh, we d we don't we don't quite understand it that way anymore. But uh, it uh, though you know military science, no one really thinks that's physics. They think it's yeah. it's it's a it's a skill set. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a difference, or maybe there's not, uh, between carpentry and physics, or modern chemistry. Would you think that there's an easy line to draw there? And if so, what what uh, is on one side of the line and and on the other? Of course, there are never easy lines to draw, but there are, there are cheap ways of getting around the problem where one could say that the definition would be, uh, let's say, a, a, a sociological definition rather than one focused on, mm -hmm. on content, uh, where you talk about the nature of the communities that practice uh, particular uh, skills or knowledge enterprises uh, and the uh, training regimes that are associated with them. So there are ways to get around it that way. Um, but of course, one of the things about the word science is that it's something that people um, want to claim all the time. Um, so there are all sorts of things, all sorts of areas of knowledge that like to call themselves science uh, in order to raise their status. Um, there's even, as a matter of fact, um, uh, something called mortuary science, uh, which is taught in some places, which you wouldn't normally think of as being, uh, as being a science, where you're being taught how to do undertaking. Um, so the use of the term it's a, it's science... A, it's a very um, lively enterprise, if I could put it that way, <laughs> in, a, in our community colleges. So, oh, yeah, you know. yeah. So, you know, the use of the term science is an honorific uh, that people want to have attached to their own enterprise. And then one can say, well, you're, you know, you're not a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, so you're not really a science, are you? Again, that would be an institutional way of excluding. Um, so these things really are quite tricky. They don't feel viscerally like they ought to count as sciences, uh, I certainly agree. Um, and yet, exclusionary uh, criteria are a bit more difficult to pin down sometimes. Well, there's not a lot of theory and abstraction in carpentry. Mm. Um, it's something that is largely learned by hands-on um, work with somebody who is already proficient. Yeah. Um, so. Well, that That's used to be the case in the sciences as well. Um, well, there's always a, there's a, certainly a laboratory science that that element still is case, still yeah. is still there. But there are other aspects of of say physics and chemistry, uh, which are learned in classroom settings, which involve principles of various kinds, partly principles of practice, but mm -hmm. also principles of nature that uh, you learn in in the process of entering uh, those fields. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't that be at least uh, one useful line and significant line of uh, delineation between carpentry and physics? Uh? Um, possibly, but it, it would therefore require any kind of discipline that is taught in a formal way in a university, let's say, um, to count as a science. And so that would extend us out into more like the German definition of Wissenschaft, uh, and that might, might be too expansive for what one wants in 
defining the word science in English. You could apply principles of botany uh, to science, to, uh, to um, carpentry, because you're, 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 you're mm -hmm. working with wood products and, and, and things of that sort. But it, it, it really wouldn't be uh, terribly worthwhile in, in um, cost-effective analysis preparing carpenters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe in, you've had in, bad experiences well, with carpenters. <laughs> oh, I, I got no level in woodwork, you know, oh, did, so indeed. I have an appreciation <laughs> for it. What about astrology? Um, now, there's system there. Um, presumably one has to learn a good deal in order to become a credible astrologer. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, it was what chiefly drove, uh, in terms of creating a market for it, you know, the observations of the heavens. So mm -hmm. we do, in fact, owe uh, a good deal in retrospect to the knowledge accumulated by people who were, some of the time, doing astrology. Including people like Kepler and Copernicus. Right, right and, and, and most of the, the great Islamic astronomers mm -hmm. are, are in the same category. Um, but uh, nowadays most people would say that astrology is a pseudo-science, um, even if the astrologer in question sincerely believes the advice he is giving based on his reading of, of what the stars are supposed to tell us. So, what, where would you put astrology on the sort of spectrum of science and more science and less science, if we're not uh, going to say it, so? It depends on what historical period you're, you're, you're paying attention to. Um, astrology was, in the 16th century, part of uh, a, a more general science of the stars that included what we think of as regular astronomy, uh, as well as astrology. Um, this is a, an argument that's been made by the historian of astronomy, Robert Westman. Um, the way in which astrology and astronomy were not distinguished from one another. And he argues, in fact, that uh, in the case of Copernicus's innovation, one of the things that pushed Copernicus into renovating the, the world system was a desire to defend basic principles of astrology from criticism. Um, so in the 16th century, you wouldn't have been able very easily to segregate off astrology, though there were people who were opposed to it. Certainly. Could you today? It's still a widespread practice. Yeah, it would be fairly easy to do, and again, you could do it on uh, a uh, sociological kind of definition, looking at the practitioners of astrology as opposed to astronomy, and say that uh, astronomy has all the marks of a science, from an institutional and social point of view, whereas astrology doesn't. But that would be the cheap way to do it. But couldn't you also do it from the point of view of the explanatory and predictive power mm -hmm. of oh, the sir, of course. And isn't that the, the most significant way to do it in terms of what we commonly understand the term science to mean? Mm -hmm. Astrology yeah. fails at, at what we now believe, at least, that astrology fails mm -hmm. at. It doesn't what do what it claims to do. What it claims to do. It's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you have a science that's wrong? Well, astrology didn't actually do any better of a job in the 16th century, and so it can't it. Uh, yes, but I guess we think it's wrong now because we can't find any deeper physical principles that should make it in its own terms work. Right, there's no reason why it should work, and as an empirical matter it doesn't seem to. Um, so it's, it's, it loses out on both it, it, do, it doesn't fit into a kind of broader scheme of knowledge mm -hmm. that we have since developed and have confidence in. Right. Whereas then, who knew? I mean, it, it, it might well have. Um, I guess the Arist Aristotelian notion was that uh, the movement of the, of the stars and, and of the planets the uh, were driven by the prime mover and gee, I mean, a prime mover can have an effect on all sorts of things, so why not take that seriously? There, there's an interesting uh, aspect there um, regarding the business of uh, demarcation criteria between science and, uh, and non-science. Um, you could say about astrology that it is structured perfectly well to be a science from a Popperian falsificationist perspective um, because it is a falsifiable science. It just so happens that it is very thoroughly falsified by yes. now, mm -hmm. but it has the structure of a proper science from a Popperian point of view. So maybe you should call it a failed science. Oh, you could do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or a Popperian science that's outlived its uh, plausibility because it hasn't, it, because it has been falsified. That would be what a Popperian would want to say.
so uh, thanks to those astrologers for, for doing us that service. I think you probably can also um, thank the early astronomers, whether they thought of themselves as engaged uh, in astronomy or, or astrology, because they, they, they set forth some maxims that then could be refuted by observation and hence uh, uh, gave us more knowledge thereby, uh, focused us on interesting problems and set the stage for, for, for later advances. Um, I often think that uh, that's the, the, the great work that Aristotle did um, in that he developed a world system that for all its imperfections could at least be tested. Yes, it's something to throw, th to throw things against, uh, gives you targets uh, and uh, topical focuses. And presumably Popper would agree with uh, uh, that as a, as a, as a great so. advantage. So, uh, you're not throwing out the concept of, of, of signs, given the fact that you know th there may be some problem with demarcation, but there are certain things that I think you'd regard as being more scientific on a number of grounds and other mm -hmm. things less? Yeah, I suppose. Okay. Um, so, you've written about the scientific revolution. Um, why do you think we have that term covering the, the events of the 16th, 17th century? Um, it's a complicated business. The term the scientific revolution um, is one that uh, only becomes widely used um, in the post-war period. Um, and part of it seems to have been uh, motivated by an ideological focus on the idea that this was a great period in the history of science uh, that helped to define what present-day science is. Uh, and if by doing historical work you could show the essence of what made the scientific revolution so-called that particular period, um, what made it um, effective as a producer of the practices and norms of modern science, you would have a handle on what it takes to do good science in general. And there were ideological concerns as to whether that period uh, produced the scientific innovations that it did uh, because of um, social pressures of various kinds, the, the need to uh, produce uh, practical benefits uh, that would correspond with the early modern uh, rise of capitalism and so on. Uh, and so there were all sorts of arguments between Marxists and anti-Marxists that revolved around this category of the scientific revolution. And everyone agreed that there was something revolutionary, whatever that exactly meant, uh, about that period, and then wanted to argue over who gets ownership over it, mm -hmm. who gets to explain why it happened. So it gets constituted as a thing so that it can be fought over uh, to some extent. Who coins the term? Oh, it, that's slightly uh, a Cambridge historian Herbert B Butterfield, um, who uh, uses the term in the later 40s. Um, the term revolution is bandied about by a variety of people. Uh, including actually people as far back as the 18th century and talking about what had happened in the previous century or two, sometimes use the word revolution. The term the scientific revolution as a sort of label uh, is something though that doesn't become generally used until, as I say, in the 1940s when suddenly people start using it. How much utility does the concept have, in your opinion? It depends on how seriously you want to take the word revolution. I like to use the term scientific revolution just in order to gesture at that, that time and place, um, the conventional period from Co Copernicus to Newton uh, in Europe um, and involving a stock cast of characters by these, by the, these, these days uh, like Galileo and whatnot. Um, I don't take the revolution word in it particularly seriously. Um, Historians sometimes like to use the word revolution a lot, industrial revolution, French revolution, um, scientific revolution, uh, as a, a, a cheap way of signaling that there were major changes that occurred in this period. Um, Any time a revolution, so-called, in history is examined more closely, historians always will find continuities uh, beneath the apparent radical changes. Uh, including with political revolutions as well. So it's not clear to what extent, not clear to me, to what extent uh, the use of the word revolution is that useful in helping to create understanding of what's going on, uh, unless there are um, self 
perceived revolutionaries who want to claim that what they're doing is bringing about a revolution, which of course happens in certain circumstances. Um, but for me, the word revolution isn't particularly um, isn't particularly illuminating. Um, one's talking about a period where things are changing, which happens in most periods of history, in most places, in most things. Um, but I don't invest a lot of significance in it. I'm just as, as happy to talk about early modern European science or the sciences in early modern Europe as talking about the scientific revolution. But I'll use it just as a term of convenience that people are used to. So when you talk about the scientific revolution, or science in general, uh, one of the things that you've tried to do, and I take this from the intelligibility of nature, is describe the tension between the effort to explain things uh, in sort of neat formulaic ways, drawing upon equations and mathematics, uh, and our desire to understand what we're explaining mm -hmm. in terms that are more comfortable to us and sort of our kind of folk understandings uh, of how the just world Just seem to works. make sense. Just seem to make sense. Uh, make sense in terms of what, for the most part? Well, in, in terms of whatever um, explanatory forms you're used to using. Um, mm -hmm explaining physical phenomena in terms of um, everyday familiar behaviors, for example. Um, Aristotle is always a, an interesting example to call in there. So when Aristotle wants to explain why bodies fall, he says it's because they're seeking the center of the earth, the center of the universe for him. Um, and this is supposed to integrate with everyday knowledge of the fact that if you have a heavy body and you let go of it, that's where it goes. Uh, and this in turn uh, correlates with uh, our understanding of how you explain why bodies move. Uh, so if you see somebody walking along and you say, why, why are you walking along in that direction? And they say, I'm going to the post office. Um, that's a way of making sense of why it is they're walking along. And so you use an analogy with a heavy body falling when you let go. You say, why is it falling? Well, it's trying to get to the center of the universe. Um, I think that there are familiar kinds of models of, of, of uh, explanation that are called on uh, and these tend to vary depending on particular particular characteristics of the societies and cultures within which they take place the cultural practices that are taken for granted by people um, no no pat answer to it in other words. so this seems to be well I, I, I kind of wonder whether you're getting here at a kind of deep-seated and, and perhaps uh, adaptive in an evolutionary sense and in somewhat biological predisposition to see, to generalize from human agency hmm. to non-human things. Often, I guess. Um, which is... But not always. Not always, hmm. but it, 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 it strikes me as one aspect of folk understanding that is implicated hmm. in notions of teleology as hmm. uh, of purpose, seeing purpose in yes. uh, the, the behavior of the natural mm -hmm. world. Now, one can credit Aristotle, I suppose, uh, in trying to kind of systematize this and say that certain things always behave, because they want to, but nonetheless always behave. Always are for the most in part. In certain ways. Aristotle. Well, I mean, he did he, <laughs> realize right. Uh, but he does try to explain then uh, some of the deviations, you know, so that why bodies sometimes can move um, horizontally uh, rather than, than than fall to earth. So he, he kind of takes that takes that up, but uh, <clears throat> he is trying to kind of get away from an idea that might have been even more deep seated and and long standing, and 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 that is that you know the world is is filled with spirits and you. The spirits have uh, various designs and goals, and you can't be uh, entirely certain what they're going to do. He's trying to introduce a degree of certainty and predictability, though he's still falling back on this sort of notion of agency and implicit purpose within within mm -hmm. the natural order. So, uh, there, you know, it, it's it, it's sort of grounded in a kind of folk physics, which may be universal to humanity. Um, but at the same time, 
uh, one could see it as a kind of uh, progressive effort to kind of put those notions on a more systematized basis. Would, would, is, that, is that a characterization of Aristotle that uh, you think works or, or, or not? Hmm, I don't know. Um, to some extent, obviously, that that's going on. He thinks um, these perfect circles for yeah. celestial bodies. I yeah. mean, he's kind of which he of course borrows from Plato, really, right. the sense of the perfection, Pythagoreans, and and yeah. people like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that happens in the early modern period, of course, is the move from what one might think of as um, organismic. Uh, and uh, teleological kinds of modes of explanation, and this is, this has to be heavily qualified, of course, always, uh, towards a mechanical conception of natural processes and the way that the universe works. The so-called mechanical philosophy uh, that grows up in the 17th century as part of the standard story of the of the scientific revolution. Um, there, it's a matter of finding familiarity. Um, and therefore a familiarity that can be used as a model for, for explanations in general, in the behavior of machines, machines like clocks. Um, and that becomes uh, quite a widely used metaphor. Uh, nature or the universe as a clock, uh, a, a, a machine made by God. Um, and that tends to redirect things away from particular kinds of teleological explanations, not, not entirely away from teleology, because it depends on the kind of teleology, which is a complication. Um, but th this means that, uh, therefore, the kind of familiar models for explaining things um, are allegedly changing in the 17th century from the more teleological and or organismic kinds of models uh, associated with Aristotelian natural philosophy uh, prior to that, in, in the Middle Ages, for example. Um, and so these, these are areas where you can point to what appear to be significant changes in style, so to speak, explanatory style in natural philosophy uh, that occur in the period of the so-called scientific revolution. There's certainly one reason why that period and that, that time and place are worth paying attention to, because important and interesting things are happening, whether or not you want to call them a revolution. So I'm trying to put the this notion of sort of the the folk understandings or the understandings drawn from the cultural environment about what natural mm -hmm. processes are, how they should be at least mm -hmm. understood, uh, into the context of the discussion of earlier or early discussion of science versus non science. Mm -hmm. So back in Aristotle's time you could agree with Aristotle that there were purposes that <clears throat> objects had but you could disagree with him about whether they could be systemized. He systematizes them. Uh, you, you, you see yourself in a, in a spookier world in which there is more possibility of, of purpose, uh, varying types of purposes in, in natural bodies. So he's done that. Um, now it is still kind of based on uh, this idea of, of agency. Um, but when you get to looking at it mechanistically rather than organically. Um, you've taken a step, a further step away from agency because now to the extent agency exists, it exists in the purposes of the clockmaker god yes. rather than in that's the right. various parts that, that, of the that, clock. That, that's where teleology <coughs> exactly. So it retreats, teleology mm -hmm. retreats uh, into that area. Um, and nowadays, most scientists, and perhaps they do this rather prematurely and without sufficient ground, uh, dismiss teleology altogether. They're, they're not looking for purpose in the natural yeah, They claim order. they do, and then it comes in back in uh, through the back door uh, very often. Where, 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 does it, where would you say it still remains? <laughs> well, uh, certainly <coughs> in, in biology, um, mm. where, where uh, biologists will give what amount to teleological functional explanations, and if you call them on it, they say, well, of course, you explain it in terms of natural selection and so on, as if, you know, they're just using a shorthand in, in talking teleologically. Um, it can be argued, though, that teleology is still very much at the root of the way that biologists do tend to think about processes. This is an argument, actually, that's made in a very recent book uh, by Jessica Riskin uh, on um, ideas of automata uh, and life and so on 
uh, from uh, actually really from the Middle Ages through into the 20th century. And she argues that teleology is central to the biological sciences even today, even when biologists try to dismiss the idea that, they're, that what they're doing is teleological, um, that, they, that they try to have it both ways. They like the convenience of using teleological arguments without acknowledging that they are using teleological arguments. And she argues that they're still essentially uh, teleological. So if, if, and she's speaking here about evolution, I suppose, first yeah. and foremost. Yeah. So if and ever, biological <coughs> in general. most people uh, after after Darwin made his big splash, uh, people came to accept common descent uh, more quickly than they came to accept yeah. his sort of non -theologic, theological notion of, yeah, of, of choice. Uh, what was that? The science of higgledy piggledy. Higgledy -piggledy, that piggledy somebody right. somebody yeah. put it. So the extent to which one can say teleology remains uh, in the biological sciences and the study of evolution, isn't one really only talking about the language that's used um, in, in, in sort of ordinary commonplace uh, ex uh, intellectual exchange and, and, and not about uh, the lack of <clears throat> A, a non teleological explanation that you could fall back on if pressed. I mean, isn't isn't ultimately natural selection? Can it be understood in a totally non theological te teleological way, or is he suggesting that it can't be? Understood She's that suggesting that um, <coughs> it tends to work both ways. That uh, in certain circumstances, biologists t uh, like to make the argument that in fact. Um, their apparently teleological descriptions of things um, can always be elaborated in, in, in selection, natural selectionist terms, or selectionist mm -hmm. terms, I should say, uh, more, more generally. Um, but that very often when they forget themselves, um, they talk in a more overtly teleological way. Um, I don't know the extent to but, which... But that's just a matter of speech. Well, that, that's, that's the standard line. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's what biologists will tell you, that it mm -hmm. is just a matter, a matter, of, a manner of speech. Uh, but in practical terms, of course, it's much easier to use the teleological language and not continually translate back to natural selectionist, uh, selectionist language. Um, well, that's our folk understandings of the world still. Yeah, kind yeah. Of. so they're still there. They're still very much lurking But not there. part of the theory, just part of the not manner part of, of speech. The formal, not part of the formal. <laughs> formal aspects mm -hmm. of them, not part of the textbook theory, as it were. So you can conceptualize the textbook theory perfectly well without falling back on teleology? Um, yeah, I guess so. So where, where then does real teleology remain? Uh, putting aside the fact that there are many scientists who are kind of religious believers and, uh -huh. and see God's right. hand in, in the nature of the world, mm -hmm. and there's, there's, there's no way of, of discounting that possibility in a kind of abstract mm -hmm. sense. But it's not used very much as an explanatory device. Not in any overt way, that's right. So, it, so if, if we began sort of with Aristotle making a small move, hmm. maybe it was a bigger move, but a, a move that, that, that still had a rather obvious teleological component, hmm. and he talks about it in those terms, yeah. I mean, he's not afraid of that. Um, he thinks it's based on his own experience, of, uh, of particularly of studying animals. And then we sort of move along to the kind of clockmaker world in which a guy like William Paley can find in the beautiful design of organisms and everything else, the hand of a creator. We've we've pushed it back there. Mm -hmm. Where does it does it still remain anywhere in point of fact apart from conventions of, of speech? I, I I guess I'm, I'm could, could can can you find it somewhere still? Um, I bet you can, but I can't use any particular <laughs> concrete example. It seems likely somehow. <clears throat> so I'm still kind of trying to kind of go back to this sort of science, non-science yeah. spectrum. So certainly teleology can be used as, a, as an interesting mm -hmm. uh, kind of metric uh, for determining um, different kinds of styles of, of explanation. Certainly. I guess carpentry doesn't involve, apart from the purposes of the carpenter and his customers. Yeah, but, but that's, a, that's a classic case. Mm -hmm. When Aristotle describes these things in the physics, mm -hmm. um, he, he uses um, carpenters 
uh, building things mm -hmm. as part of his right. uh, a, a kind of teleology and teleological mm -hmm. explanation, final causes. As if the world is sort of built in the, yeah. in the, yeah. in the same yeah. way. Um, do you think that science is, is facing any project of science? Is, you know, we, we, the project of science was, I would probably say, historically speaking, much more confident in itself, not necessarily more or less productive, but more confident in itself 50 or 60 years ago than it is now. Is, is there, and we don't want to use big words like revolution and maybe not crisis either, but is there a kind of intellectual crisis um, that is uh, arising out of the doubts that, that uh, you and many other people have about whether there is a kind of crisply definable phenomenon called science in the world? I, I don't think that most scientists will worry about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, if historians of science worry about those things, scientists have, have bigger fish to fry, they're actually doing science. Uh, so I don't think that there's that kind of a, a problem. Of course, there, there, there have been in the past um, periods when scientists, physical scientists in particular, think that they pretty much got it all sorted out. Mm -hmm. Late 19th century is a classic mm -hmm. case mm -hmm. of that, where they think that they've solved all the big major problems. And then, of course, a little while later, they find that everything falls apart and they, they really don't seem to have achieved as much as they thought they had. But it really does depend on the particular scientific discipline. Um, the overall ideology of science with a capital S that would encompass all the disciplines that we want to call science um, is something that's a, a rather fragile construct. Uh, and I suppose that uh, faith in it as an ideological construct, as an almost an item of faith, um, is something that uh, changes in different periods. Um, perhaps it's perceived as more fragmented now than it sometimes has been perceived as being in the past, with the idea that you could reduce everything to the same basic framework. I'm thinking of you know the logical positivists mm -hmm. in the interwar mm -hmm. period, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, uh, thinking that you can you can. Uh, take hold of everything that ought to count as a real science and reduce it to the same basic logical structure. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't seem to be very popular these days, not only among scientists, but even among philosophers of science. They don't buy into that unifying science with a capital S approach anymore, uh, and much more focus on the details of how things are done in particular scientific disciplines, and that's philosophers of science. Toward the end of, of your book on the intelligibility of nature, you talk about quantum physics um, and the challenge it, it, it sent to the scientific community. Uh, people had got used to the operation of Newtonian physics. Um, effects at, at, at distances didn't seem to disturb anybody anymore not necessarily because we kind of understand how they operate, but simply because we have gotten used to them. But, but, but quantum physics, with its seeming assault on the, on the nature of causation itself, um, has been, uh, is a bigger fish to fry uh, in terms of absorbing it into a kind of comfortable understanding of, of nature as a whole. Um, uh, the scientific community, though, has kind of taken that in stride, pretty comfortable with it. Uh, what, about, what about philosophers of science? Um, uh, where to begin there? Uh, one thing I wanted to say about um, action at a distance, mm -hmm. actually, is that it itself uh, acted as a similar sort of example where some people found it perfectly intelligible, so to speak. They were perfectly happy with it, but others certainly didn't. So you had a 19th century physicist like Maxwell um, arguing that action at a distance made no sense. Uh, and he postulated the existence of this universal material ether mm -hmm. to convey action uh, from body to body through this, through this material medium. And he says it's more philosophical to postulate the existence of a medium that we can't, can't describe than to imagine that something can affect something else with no uh, intermediate uh, communication between them. Uh, so that, that was a very basic kind of sensibility as to what made sense and what didn't. And then you get an analogous kind of thing with the advent of uh, quantum mechanics 
and the use of uh, probabilistic and statistical arguments in quantum mechanics uh, on the part of Einstein with his famous remark, God doesn't play dice with the universe. This isn't the way to make sense of things. And it's, again, it's a very visceral response. Uh, if you were Niels Bohr, that sort of thing didn't bother you. Uh, so there, there's no, again, there's, there's no clear-cut, one-size-fits-all um, accounting for these different kinds of attitudes. And in fact, if one's going to be looking at um, different cultural contexts to explain the different sensibilities of different people, you would have to look at very similar kinds of professional backgrounds on the part of Einstein and of Bohr uh, as regards their training and so on, uh, and to determine why it is that Bohr is happier with this, this kind of thing than Einstein is, and their association with um, different kinds of, of philosophical systems that they, they're comfortable with. Uh, that's, that's quite a high level of cultural differentiation between people who have been trained in very similar sorts of ways in a broader sense. So again, um, one can try to account for these things in terms of um, cultural presuppositions, but um, you couldn't always predict them in advance, I think. That's part of the difficulty. So, quantum mechanics, which defies in some respects our, our notions of, of, of causation, which for a long time were thought to be absolutely central to what yeah. science was about, um, because you can't predict specific outcomes, right. that's the problem. You can't predict right. when this uranium atom is going to decay. Um, nonetheless, is for most people at least comfortably absorbed into the body of science because even though you can't make specific predictions, you can still make um, mathematical well, st assessments statistically, of statistically. statistically reliable mm -hmm. ones to do with any significant volume or quantity, I should say, of, uh, of material. Though, in fact, Maxwell argued uh, in his own day that all of physics is basically statistical because mm -hmm. whenever we're dealing with the behavior of any normal sized lump of matter, we're dealing with countless numbers of atoms. Uh, which all have their own particular characteristics of motion and all the rest of it. Um, and so we can only talk about them in the average, uh, which is a kind of a, a forerunner of statistical talk in physics that comes along with the advent but of But nonetheless, theory. but you can yeah. visualize all these little particles in a kind of general you way, so it's not can. as uncomfortable. You imagine yeah. you can, whereas right. you But you as regards to procedures that. in management, mm -hmm. you can see that as, as not vastly dissimilar from sensibilities that arise later. People talk today too about a, si a crisis in science having to do with its politicization. Mm. Um, but I suppose in various respects that's always Not been true, true as, as well. Mm. Um, do you think that big science is more susceptible to politicization than the kind of more dispersed, smaller-scale efforts that characterize science in the past? Well, it's frequently argued that um, large-scale federal funding of physics in this country, um, particularly from, from military projects, tended to distort the um, directions of um, research that would have occurred without that massive funding uh, directed towards particular uh, projects of military significance. And no doubt that has to be the case to some extent. Um, and that there, are often, there have often been ideological dimensions to scientific theories, um, by which I mean in, including um, religious kinds of uh, attitudes. So if you look at uh, responses to Darwin, of course, um, there's a great deal of contestation from, from the perspective of theists who, who want to have God directly involved in um, the creation of, of uh, species and forms of life uh, and not allow it to occur purely by um, a, uh, a, a, a brute, as it were, mechanistic process of natural selection. Uh, that is certainly um, an aspect of uh, broader ideological uh, inflecting of the direction of scientific discussions and arguments. Uh, and you can always find things like that. Is it? I mean, people in some way today are more suspicious, I think, uh, 
in certain quarters of our society of official science and global in the, warming. History, in the case of global warming, yeah. um, is 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 that debate sort of analogous to debates that have occurred previously, or is it something new? I don't know. That's an interesting, an interesting point. Um, I have wondered sometimes why um, the uh, global warming debates have seemed to be more susceptible to um, general um, skepticism by non-scientists than other, other areas of science. But of course one can say the same thing for evolution in some quarters, uh, where people feel uh, that they have the appropriate standing to question the idea of evolution, even though they don't have uh, the technical knowledge that would be uh, regarded by scientists as relevant to that determination. Similar sort of thing goes for, uh, for global warming as well. Um, a very elaborate and complex uh, set of scientific procedures and practices and understandings being ridden roughshod, uh, ridden over roughshod by people who think that they know about the weather. Um, that, that sense of immediate um, relationship with the object of study rather than with the procedures whereby those objects are studied uh, seems to give a greater familiarity and make people feel more perhaps uh, closely linked to the things being discussed by scientists and to feel that they have an appropriate standing to question what scientists say uh, even without necessarily knowing much about what the content of those arguments is. Um, but it is curious um, that way, um, why some things invite skepticism and other things don't. And of course it depends on what the motivation might be to, to be skeptical in the first place, which is perhaps even more important. I would, I would, I would think that part of the, the pushback against global warming uh, arguments are that they're perceived as being status, that is to say, as mm -hmm. justifications for increasing yeah. the regulatory power of the state, you know, mm -hmm. regulatory power of the mm -hmm. economy, um, which doesn't arise. I mean, there are different issues when you come to a theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It doesn't have quite that thrust, but mm -hmm. um, I suspect that's probably what's at play here. So, uh, I mean, actually, that reminds me of an, another analogy, uh, which would have to do with things like nuclear power, nuclear power stations and so on, which also tend to invite um, a more uh, strong authoritarian state structure to make sure that these things remain safe. Uh, you can't have a, a loose state structure and have nuclear power stations all over the place because you're not able to control the, the necessary safety requirements of dealing with nuclear power stations. And yet there seems to be less of a popular rejection uh, of um, nuclear power by people who would be very ready to reject global warming than you might on those grounds expect. So it's not always clear-cut as to why things take the direction they do. I mean, well, why, why libertarians aren't more opposed to nuclear power, I don't know. They ought to be, really. They see it as a source of cheap energy, I which is going to so, energize yeah. the, the, yeah. the marketplace. You would, you would think, actually, that, the, that, that people who are concerned about climate change mm. might embrace oh, yes. nuclear power so, more strongly, so. but they don't, right. by and large. Yeah. It's a kind of taboo. So uh, if we can bring this thing full circle, we started talking about what makes a science uh, a science, and um, if some of the markers between science and non-science are conventional, and if what you're really talking about is a sort of spectrum of forms of knowledge acquisition, um, we sort of come back to a question that's sort of uh, uh, deeply embedded in, in the philosophy of, of knowledge, of epistemology. What, 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 what makes knowledge or the, what makes the search for knowledge more likely to be successful than not? What we can, what can we say if we're trying to categorize knowledge acquisition strategies in a general way uh, about what makes them successful as opposed to what makes them more likely to fail. Is there anything we can say in those terms? Well, one general thing that uh, occurs to me is that um, in determining the success of a knowledge enterprise, uh, 
it has to do with how you determine what it is you're trying to find out. In other words, what will constitute success. And I think in some cases, one might be saying that whatever it is that I'm capable of doing with this particular kind of an approach will count as success. That's to say, the things that I'm capable of finding out will count as the things that I want to find out in a circular sort of a way. Um, it's, it's seldom, I think, the case that people say, I want to find out X over here, and now I'm going to figure out from, from a standing start how to find that out over there. Instead, you, you decide that the things you want to find out are, are, as a matter of fact, lo and behold, precisely the kinds of things you are capable of finding out by using the tools at your disposal. So I think there's a lot of that. Mission-oriented science has always been much more difficult than science where you don't have a, a, a pre-established independent goal. Uh, goal. So things like you know the war on cancer uh, uh, has been a thing certainly uh, that has um, discovered lots of interesting things, but it isn't the sort of thing where you can simply say, all right, we'll pour lots of money into it and we will solve this problem. Um, so the success of science depends to some extent uh, on particular scientists being able to define their own goals as determined by what they're capable of doing, rather than deciding I'm going to find something out and then set about trying to do it from a standing start. So there's a certain circularity in the success of science. Science is successful at finding out what science is capable of finding out. But there is a certain constancy, I think, in terms of what humans regard as being useful, human utility. Uh, if you look at the whole history of the species, long before there was science or even society, uh, there was a kind of gradual edging forward in the ability to kind of control the environment. Uh, and. Uh, produce human populations have over time expanded to mm -hmm. produce adaptive outcomes. So there is a kind of, while you know, knowledge can have kind of social and psychological functions and political functions, there is also a, a kind of bedrock of, of utility functions. Uh, and mm -hmm. presumably there are better and worse ways of uh, discovering uh, how to achieve those utilities. So uh, with respect to that bedrock function, uh, are there things we can say about what better serves and what less well serves? Well, I don't think, for example, that people have um, in any particular time or place routinely said, we really need to increase our population. Let's see if we can double or triple it as soon as possible and then set about trying to do it. Um, it occurred, and one can in retrospect say, well, this suggests a, a certain uh, control of the environment uh, uh, as, as being effective and, and reflecting. Well, let's, let's bring the down more wildebeest off. so that we can feast more often. Yeah, well, uh, be let's more keep, like it. keep the hyenas away by uh -huh. doing something yeah. at night. Yeah. Um, you know, let's uh, keep ourselves warm when it turns cold. I mean, people right, are thinking better. in those terms, right. and that adds up to better adaptation. So, at, at that level, can't one try to? Um, begin to craft the notion of a science on the basis of what works better and finding out how we solve these problems and, and what techniques are, are less effective. Well, that's um, working with uh, an understanding of science that focuses on um, practical utility, the kinds of things that can mm -hmm. solve practical, mm -hmm. uh, practical uh, difficulties. Um, science, though, of course, is also understood in terms of uh, its intellectual structure, being able to understand the world, quite independent of whether one might want to put that understanding or be able to put that understanding to practical use or not. Um, so when Copernicus says the Earth moves and orbits around a central sun and so forth, um, that isn't something that is in itself producing pra immediate practical benefits, and yet we want to regard that as uh, a significant step in the science of astronomy and cosmology, uh, because we think that this is getting closer to what we nowadays regard as the truth about these things. Uh, the relationship of that to practical knowledge is uh, not therefore straightforward, and yet both of those things in different circumstances relate to our general sense of what the word science refers to. Um, I think that what science, what counts as science is itself a rather, uh, a rather complex amalgam of different desiderata and goals. Though nowadays SpaceX would have a lot of trouble operating on the basis of Ptolemaic astronomy. <laughs>
or Aristotelian physics. So well, eventually well, those one, things one did of, prove one out. Of the, one of the things that's, um, that's uh, routinely said about, for example, the Apollo missions is that they were all done on the basis of Ptolemaic astronomy, on geocentric astronomy. They didn't need to have a, a, a they didn't need to determine the relative motions of bodies um, on the basis of a uh, of a, 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 a heliocentric system or a system where the Earth. I, I thought they generally said that, that, that it succeeded on the basis of Newtonian physics rather than well, no, having in, in, terms of in terms of the kinematic in terms of the kinematics of things. You you just did it on the basis of something that would be familiar to a. Uh, Ptolemaic astronomy as an uh, astronomer. Uh, it's, it's like uh, navigation on the Earth. You treat the Earth, if you're, if you're a navigator, certainly before one had GPS and so on, and maybe even with GPS, um, uh, as if the Earth were stationary, uh, and yet you still crank out uh, results that work and uh, techniques that will serve you to Could we have achieve sent your a, a voyager to Mars on the basis of a no, Ptolemaic uh, understanding? That, that might have been more That might have been a little, a little harder, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, we could go on for a long time with this, but but thank you very much for coming here and for a very stimulating talk yesterday and a, a very stimulating conversation thank today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks very much. My pleasure too.